Hey friends, Patrick God here. Welcome to this little entity framework core tutorial. Thanks for dropping by and you know it already. It's about the database first approach. Some of you wanted to see this and I gotta say this is actually done pretty quick. So I assume you already got your database, maybe SQL Server, SQLite, whatever it is. And then you want to get these tables into your web API, for instance. So you want to create the models, the corresponding models to your tables and then the question is how is this done how can you do this and again this is done pretty pretty fast it's pretty easy and simple but the big question is what are you going to do next so we will cover this in this tutorial and i would say we just start but maybe before if you like this tutorial and learn something i would really appreciate it if you click the like button maybe even subscribe to my channel don't forget to hit the bell icon to get a notification for new videos also please consider subscribing to my newsletter because then you get these kind of videos here earlier in your inbox and also access to upcoming online courses for instance the .NET web developer bootcamp where we cover the backend part with the web api the front end part with blazor web assembly and also some other stuff like git scrum agile web development so stuff like that if you're interested then please consider subscribing to my newsletter thank you very much for that links are in the video description of course as always and the last thing today it's tea again but your support helps me to stay awake as you can see here this is the baby phone and it is green and no no blue bar if if you would hear some sounds then you would see a blue bar but there is no blue bar this means my little boy is asleep and by the way he's two years old now crazy right so two years on this planet in these crazy times but uh, we are all healthy we are all well so this is great and now i stop talking enjoy the tutorial all right let's start this time with sql server management studio because i want to show you how to do this database first approach with a SQL Server database and as you can see here I've got this Blazor e-commerce database and I just assume that you also already have a database or at least have a SQL script with this thing you can create then a new database with tables and so on because otherwise why would you want to watch a video about the database first approach right well maybe just out of curiosity anyways we need a database first. So this is the one, this is the Blazor e-commerce database of my Blazor e-commerce course in essence. Maybe you wanna have a look. And here you can see that we have uh, several tables already, addresses, card items. Well, in essence, it starts with the users, right? They've got an ID, email, and so on. And then also the products are pretty important, I guess, with the title, description, and so on. So this is lots and lots of stuff. The orders, images, categories, and so on. And now we want to use the database first approach of Entity Framework Core to get these models here in our web API, for instance. And then we will also add one or two controller methods to, well, get some products or create some products, something like that, right? So we've got our database here and everything is empty. This is important to note, I guess, uh, because when you have a look here, and then you see we have no users. We have also, um, well, we have products. So it's not totally true what I told you. We have products because these are seeded with this database. So this is actually pretty nice because with that we can already create a controller method again to um, yeah to get these products then after we created these models here in our project. So long story short, let's create a new web API project with Visual Studio 2022. There it is already, ASP.NET Core Web API. We click next and let's call this EF Core DB first tutorial great name net 6 it is configure for https yes we want to use controllers not a minimal api the traditional controllers and also open api support for swagger ui so we can test this thing let's create it all right and when this is done of course we see the default weather forecast controller and the model and so on but now we can actually already start with the ef core stuff but before we can do that we need two NuGet packages we can either install them with the package manager console or 
uh, you choose the uh, package, the new get package manager. So right click the project and then manage new get packages. And in here in the browse tab, the first thing we need is entity framework core. And it's not server the first we need also the SQL server provider. But first, I want to install the tools. So that's the package we need Entity framework core tools for the new get package manager console and visual studio. So please install this thing. Click OK, and I accept. And then you need the provider for your database. And in my case, it's the SQL server, there's also SQL lights. And you see it here other databases as well. So SQL server in this specific case, it is we click install OK, and I accept. And when this is done, we can close this, open the package manager console. Let's have a look, where are we? Well, let's change the directory to EF core DB first tutorial. And now we are in the project. And now we can use the scaffold DB context command. So scaffold and then DB context it is. And now you already need the connection string. So can be tricky at times, but if you're using SQL Express, for instance, like I do it in my case, then you enter server SQL Express, then the database name, in our case, that would be blazer e commerce, and then also trusted connection to true. So this is then the connection string. Then we need the provider for our database, which is then Microsoft, Microsoft entity framework core, and then SQL server, and then also an output directory. Let's just say we call this models. All right, so scaffold DB context, and then in quotation marks, the complete connection string with server SQL Express database is blazer e commerce in my case, trust the connection set to true, then the provider Microsoft entity framework core SQL server, and then as a parameter, the output directory. In our case, let's just say let's just say this is then the models directory doesn't have to exist. And now the whole thing is building, the build is succeeded. And yes, we get some warnings. So this is, well, how it's done with the DB first approach, what does it say, sensitive information regarding the connection string, All right? Now normally it would be mapped to a non nullable bool property, but it has default constraint to a nullable bool property to allow difference between setting the property. To, okay, so I am pretty sure if you already have a database that is bigger, then there might be some stuff where you just have to pay attention and uh, then have a look in essence, if everything works as expected. But the great thing now here is, you can already see it here, we've got our DB context, right? So this is the thing we can use to access our models and or the entities, the tables, and also the data, of course, we have our connection string here on configuring um, is, is generated for us and also on model creating with an index and foreign keys. As you can see here, a user has one address. We've got the um, a combined key for the card item and so on. So lots of stuff that Energy Framework creates for us. These are here. These are the warnings we just saw, I guess. And that should be it in essence. Now the next thing we should do, or maybe we should have a look at the models first. Let's just have a look at the user model. For instance, we've got an ID, email, password, hash, password, salt, date created the role, and then a virtual property because of the relationship. So we've got also our address. And uh, now let's have a quick look here. There's the user. 
ID, email, password, hash, password, salt, date created and role. And then when we have a look at the address, for instance, we've got the ID and the user ID and all the other stuff. And now back to Visual Studio, we see here the user as a virtual property again, and also the user ID, right? So when we now get our, uh, well, information in essence from the database with the controller, for instance, we will do that in a second, and then we might be able to also get the user or the address, depends on what we wanna get first um, of the specific entity. So I would say we do that, but first the next step, really important is we have to register the DB context. This is not done automatically. So with builder services, and then add a DB context, we get our blazer e-commerce contexts or register this thing. And we have to at uh, using directive and that would be using EF Core DB first tutorial models. That's the one and let's just make this global so everyone knows about that. Okay, and now I would say we create a controller for our products because we already have some products and we also have virtual virtual properties here, like the category, for instance. And when we have a look at our database again, we see the products here, category ID here, and then our categories. And let's have a look here. Also some data in here as well. So maybe we can do something with that without the need to add new data in essence. So let's Let's add a product controller, I would say, just for testing purposes. It is an empty API controller. And we call this now product controller. We add the constructor because in here now we inject our Blazor e-commerce context. So Blazor e-commerce contexts call this context and initialize this field. I like to add the underscore here. All right, and now simply a get method. So HTTP get it is. And now here we say public async task, I action results, let's call this get products. And in here now, we simply say return OK and then wait. Context products to list uh, to list async. All right, and we need EF core for that. And I also want to make this a global. And if you want, of course, you can also move this to the program CS or another file where you just add these global usings. So maybe it's a bit better organized, more organized than in this case. Okay, I would say we test this now. It is time. And let's just see how the result looks. There we are, we've got our product. If you're wondering why we don't see the uh, schema here, the, the actual product class or the model, it's because of this thing here. We just returned an actual result, but we can change this real quick in essence by doing it like that. So we specify really what we are returning. And yes, we wanna rebuild and apply the changes. And now we see a bit more stuff, right? So now we see lots and lots of stuff that is, uh, well, used in the products itself. So we see the product model, we see the images, order items, the product type, the product variant, and so on. Okay, so now we try this, we hit execute, and we get a list of products. Isn't that nice? Now the problem is, well, it's not really a problem, but there are, uh, well, how can I say this? You see the images are empty. 
order items, product variants. And when we have a look at the database again, let's see, what about the images first, right? So let's close the addresses. Do we have images? No, these are not, all right. But what about the product variants now? Well, there are product variants. Why don't we see any product variants here? Well, there's an easy fix to that. We can simply say include and then a lambda expression for every product, please also include the product variants. And maybe we put this in a new line and also this, save it. It is rebuilt, I guess. Try it out, hit execute. And you get an error. A possible object cycle was detected. Well, this is totally true because now when we have a look at the product variant, we also have a virtual uh, pro property here for the product. So when we get the product and we include the product variants, we get the product variant and this thing also wants to include the product again. So then again, we come back here and want to, you know, you, I think you get the idea. So what we can do is simply say JSON ignore as an attribute at the using directive with control period or the click, just click on the light bulb for the quick fix menu. And with this attribute now we should not get the products, but let's, let's have a look. Okay. Try this out. Hit execute. Hey, it works. Nice. So now we've got the product variants as well. And this is now the thing you have to consider, right? So DB first is great. You, you get your models pretty fast, but now you have to change the model here. Uh, in, in a way where you have to add this attribute, for instance, or the totally different way would be, and maybe the better way, better practice in essence, is to create DTOs, data transfer objects, um, where you know how the specific object you wanna get from the web API looks like. So if you wanna, um, I don't know, create a product DTO, for instance, then you would use the ID, the title description and so on, but maybe you don't need the product variant here, or you use another product variant DTO where you then have uh, an object with the product variant information, but not with the product because you know that you don't need it. Because the thing is, when, don't know how you build your project, but if you're changing the database with SQL Server Management Studio or in any other way and not in the code first way, then you you need the models again, right? You have to generate the models and we can test this actually. If, I think you, you know what I wanna say, if you change something and you then run the scaffolding again, then your changes that you did here in the code are gone. So let's let's just have a look again. Well, or it says we cannot create it use the flag force. Okay. So we use the flag force. And what happened now to our product variant? Well, the JSON ignore is gone. And you have to do the work again, and again, and again. So you really have to pay attention here if you want to use the DB first approach. Another way to do all that is to well, you have your database, I get it, I totally get it, trust me. I was in that situation lots of times. And you use the scaffolding, but then after you did this, it would be better than to use the code first approach, right? So you start an initial migration with the EF core code first migrations, and then 
your changes are done here in the code and then you add another migration, update the database and so on. I've got videos about that. When you want me to create a video specifically about the code first migration where you where we really focus on that stuff, please tell me that in the comments and then I will do so. But I've got the video about all relationships with Entity Framework Core 6 in .NET 6. So there we already use the code first approach in essence, in every other video where we use a database with Entity Framework Core, I'm using the code first approach. And of course, again, for instance, in the Blazor e-commerce course or all my other courses, it is code first. I just think it is the better way to use EF Core if you want to use EF Core. But if not, then maybe you want to use DEPA. Hint here, a video about DEPA is coming soon. Maybe I don't forget to add the info card here. Otherwise, please have a look at my channel and don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so, well, this is not a big tutorial here, talking a lot because it's it's more a question about the, the concepts and the way to, to create your application, to build your application. And you ask me in the comment section about the database first approach. So this is how it's done. It's really, it's really not, not much. This is the important stuff here. This is the command first, not with the force flag, but you need the scaffold DB context, connection string, and the output directory. And you need the Entity Framework Core tools and then the database provider. There's also another way to do it, not with scaffold DB context. You can also use .NET EF and then the and then DB context. So maybe we can have a look here net ef right and then you've got db context so let's have a look here net ef and then db context help and you see that scaffold right so what we can do now is db context ah, db context net ef db context scaffold and what about that? Well, we can define, where is it? Well, we've got the force flag again, we've got the output directory. And yeah, we've got the connection string again, and also the provider to use. So pretty similar to the scaffold DB context command. And it really looks pretty similar. So again, we need the connection string, maybe I can copy this here. So that would be this thing. And let's just copy this. And now with scaffold and then the connection string, then the provider. And here we can just say minus O models. And I think we now get the arrow again because the models are already here, already exists, correct? So let's add the force flag. And wait a sec, dash F, now it should work. Yeah, all right, so we get the warnings with the would normally be mapped to a non nullable property and so on. But you get the idea, again, the same model. So two ways to do that. I hope you learned something. And in essence, that's already it. This is how the database first approach works with Entity Framework Core. As I said, pretty simple, right? You've got your scaffolding command. You can use the .NET CLI if you want, but the big question is, when you well scaffolded the DB context, when you got your models from your tables, what are you going to do next? Do you want to change your database, your table with uh, SQL Server Management Studio, for instance? So really sticking to the database first approach, or do you want to switch to the code and then use the code first approach where you then just add migrations and let Entity Framework Core do its magic and change the tables? It's totally up to you. And I think you know that I am a fan of the code first approach, definitely use I like to use migrations and uh, yeah that's why I'm a big fan of entry framework in a sense but as I already uh, said in the tutorial Depa is for instance also a great 
ORM, Object Relational Mapper, a tiny, no, what's it called, a micro ORM, where we can, uh, of course, also, well, run SQL statements and then uh, get the results as our models in our web API, for instance. But this is for another video. If you want to see more depth, then please, again, write it down in the comments and uh, then I will do that, of course, for you guys. So thanks for watching. If this video resonated with you, then please consider clicking the like button, maybe subscribing to my channel, clicking the bell icon, of course, also the newsletter. Maybe this is something for you for the upcoming .NET Web Developer Bootcamp. And the last thing, again, thank you guys so much for all your support. Oh, it's great tea to uh, calm down a little bit, right? So maybe you don't need coffee all the time. And as you may be heard in the video, I was really, really, really tired when I recorded this. Uh, so yeah, I definitely need more coffee. All right, so that's it, I guess. If you want to see more, then check out these videos here on the side. Maybe there is something you like, then click on this thing and enjoy this next tutorial. And apart from that, I can only say again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for watching and I hope I see you next time. Take care.